Okay, thank you so much. And thank you so much to the visitors, uh, the listeners who are here today to join us. So what I want to do is to talk about the um, Summer Institute planning for 2016 and give you some sense of what the pro application process is for participation and also uh, what we're attempting to do uh, in that program. And we're also going to have webinars uh, weekly for the next three weeks after this one where more detail will be provided. So I'm just going to give a sort of summary overview today. Uh, so uh, last summer we had the first uh, National Flood Interoperability Summer Institute that was held at the University of Alabama in the National Water Center. Uh, 44 graduate students from 19 universities spent six weeks at the National Water Center or visiting there from June the 1st through July 17th. And this was supported financially by the National Weather Service through the National Science Foundation and QASI. And I really want to thank everybody for all the work they did to make this such a success as it was. I think it was a wonderful experience for everyone involved, and Emily was certainly a, a central a part of that. Uh, the National Weather Service wants to do the same thing again this year and have a uh, summer Institute that will this year be from June 6th instead of June 1st, but the same basic idea. And there is a, a team that's been developed to support this. Uh, I'm the technical director of the activity, uh, Emily Clark, who's on the phone just a moment ago as the course coordinator. Uh, and there's a series of advisory faculty whose names you can see here who've been helping us to put the program together. Uh, there's also a set of theme leaders that have been uh, selected on the basis of applications to a, some, um, a solicitation that Quasi put out before Christmas. Uh, there's some student coordinators and theme coordinators that are also going to be uh, helping us uh, from the student side. Um, so we're going, to, we're going to have a webinar another in a week from today where the theme leaders are going to talk more about the research themes, and I'm just going to introduce those today. Uh, so the Summer Institute has an application um, process, and Emily is going to explain that. So can you can you take over, Emily, please? Sure. So I'm Emily Clark at Quasi, as David had said, and I'm kind of the logistical contact for the Summer Institute program at Quasi. So we have kind of a central hub of information set up on the Quasi website where you can find you know, the relevant information that you need to apply to the Summer Institute program. So the link for that website is posted on the screen right now. It is www.quasi.org slash Summer Institute. And this is where you can go to find not only the application information and instructions, but also the webinar schedule uh, for upcoming webinars and the recorded webinars will be posted and available on this website as well. We also are going to have information on the Summer Institute support staff, so the theme leaders and the course coordinators that are going to be involved in the program, and there will be additional information on the Summer Institute themes. So I would encourage you to check out this website if you haven't done so already. Take a look at the information that's posted there. And if you have any questions, definitely reach out to us at Quasi. And the email to do that is going to be it's, um, the communications manager email. It's on the website right now. It's actually c-o-m-m-g-r at quasi.org. And I will uh, post that into the chat box after I'm done speaking. So the student eligibility for this program is that current and incoming graduate students, as well as postdocs within three years of graduating with their PhD, are going to be eligible to apply to the program. Um, you must be enrolled in a US university to be eligible. So uh, foreign students are, are OK to apply, or, or people who are not US citizens, but you must be enrolled in a US university. Students who are not U.S. citizens will need to report their visa status on the application form. So on the application form that I'm going to talk about in a moment, um, there is a, a question that will ask you to report what type of visa you have uh, if you're not a U.S. citizen. This is, this is slightly different from last year's program uh, due to security requirements at the National Water Center. Additionally, another change that we've made this 
year is that there will not be a non-resident track for this year's program. So students must be able to reside on site at the University of Alabama and participate in person for the full seven weeks of the program. So to apply to the Summer Institute, we're using an online portal called Proposal Space. So you'll need to you'll need to create a free account on the Proposal Space website before you can submit your application. So the direct link uh, to the call for applications is posted in the webinar right now. It's also available from that that Summer Institute webpage I mentioned earlier. So uh, go ahead, check that out, create an account. It's pretty simple. You just need to create a username and a password. And that will enable you to log in and start an application. Um, there are several components that I'm going to talk about next to the application. So you can go in, you can start your application, you can save it as a draft until you're ready to submit it. If you have any questions, again, about the, the proposal-based application portal, please feel free to reach out to Quasi. So the application consists of several components. So the first is just answering the application form, entering some information um, into the questionnaire that we've created within Proposal Space. The second component is a statement of interest. So we'd like a brief statement of interest that explains why you'd like to participate in the Summer Institute and how the Summer Institute will continue, uh, contribute to your graduate studies. So this statement of interest should be short. Uh, it can be one to two paragraphs. And we'd like it to please not exceed one page. We'd also like a CV detailing your education and research experiences. We'd like a copy of your transcript. And this can be a, a non-official copy, so it doesn't need to be signed by the, the registrar. And we'd also like a letter of endorsement from your faculty advisor. So uh, we'd like you know, to hear that your faculty advisor is, is willing to kind of support you through this program. Um, and we'd like to hear from them how your involvement in the Summer Institute will contribute to your, to your studies and your experiences. So all of these components to the application can be uploaded as PDFs directly into that proposal space website. So the application deadline to submit all of these materials is 11.59 p.m. Eastern Time on Tuesday, March 15, 2015. So please make sure that you've uploaded all your application materials and you've submitted your application by that date. Any applications that are in draft status um, won't be rolled forward into the, into the queue to review. And so after the applications are submitted, the, we will review them. And um, there are limited, limited spaces in the Summer Institute. So the selected students will receive um, not only just the ability to participate in the Summer Institute, but reimbursement of round trip travel expenses to get you to the University of Alabama in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, uh, room and board at the University of Alabama, which will be provided through dorm spaces. Last year, we had a, a pretty pretty nice dorm space. It was fairly new, and uh, students each got their own room, but it was a shared, shared like apartment type suite. Um, you'd also have program tuition and access to the Summer Institute instructors and materials covered for your time at the Summer Institute. And then a new uh, component that we've added this year is Part of the student award is that the student's advisor will receive travel support to attend either the boot camp portion of the Summer Institute, which will take place the first week of the Summer Institute, or to come down at the end of the Summer Institute and participate in the capstone event. So that's all I have. So uh, again, if you have any questions, I'll, I'll type that email address into the chat box and so reach out to Quasi. Um, and Dr. Maiman, I will send it back over to you. Okay, thank you so much then, uh, Emily. So, as I mentioned earlier, we had 44 students from 19 universities uh, in uh, last year, and we divided them into project teams, and each team was uh, three or four students, and they did group projects together that the student teams themselves devised. In other words, we didn't 
tell them this is what you've got to do. We said here's the environment that you're working in and we want you to formulate a project yourselves that will contribute to that. Uh, there's a special issue of the Journal of the American Water Resources Association that's now being compiled with papers that were contributed coming from last year's uh, Summer Institute. Uh, there are two student coordinators and two faculty coordinators that were resident in Tuscaloosa last year and we're going to have a more complete system with some additional people this year. Um, and we had some faculty that were engaged to, to help out with uh, teaching and so on and that will be formalized a bit more also as we go along this year. So uh, we had a one-year program in NIFI phase one and the key thing that we demonstrated was that the academic community built our near real-time flood data modeling and forecasting system for 2 million, 2.7 million stream reaches of the continental US um, and we demonstrated that we could execute that in 10 minutes at the Texas Advanced Computing Center. A more elaborate version of this is being made operational as the National Water Model in June of 2016, actually while the Summer Institute is going on at the National Water Center. So there will be an official version of this model running in a few months' time. Uh, what did we learn? Well, first of all, we demonstrated that we can operate at continental scale using our own high-performance computing system. Uh, we showed that cross-university synthesis and graduate students uh, it was just fantastic. I mean, it was just unbelievable to see all the students from different universities working together. And it was obvious that the student-led projects were really highly motivational to the teams involved. Um, and we probably need more direct engagement by the faculty at the home institutions to produce continuity of effort, especially after the Summer Institute is over. And that's why we're providing travel support for student advisors to come to the Summer Institute uh, during the period that it runs. Uh, this is one of the projects that was done by a team last year by um, Caleb, Cassandra, Curtis and Nikhil from Utah State University, University of Texas, Brigham Young University and Purdue University respectively. And this one had to do with uh, uh, detailed flood mapping here in Austin, Texas. But what was really amazing to me was just to see these unit students coming together from different universities and all working together uh, just across institutional boundaries in a way that we just haven't done in Quasi before. And the, uh, Cassandra, who was my student in this group, came back and said, I've got a network of contacts all over the country now, and she was obviously pleased about that. Uh, so organizationally, the way this works is that the National Weather Service and its partner agencies, like the U.S. Geological Survey and FEMA Corps of Engineers, works with academia, which is QUASI and the National Science Foundation, and then we in turn work with commercial partners, like uh, ESRI, Kistas, which is a water data management firm, Microsoft Research, and others. And that way, commercial partners involved in the Summer Institute as well, but through the academic community. Um, we have an annual cycle of activities whereby we have a large-scale experiment, and I'll explain a little bit what our large-scale experiment is going to be this year. A selection of candidates, which we're now uh, entering into the process for that. We have a Summer Institute, which has a boot camp for a week, then a research phase for six weeks, and then a capstone event. And then publications, in this case a featured collection in the Journal of the American Water Resources Association, and then there's preparations with another large-scale experiment and so on. Uh, this is an attempt to have a, a con continuous innovation, whereby there's a national water center which has its operational system, which is based on supercomputing, and the research community through QUASI also has its own environment in supercomputing, and the R2O means research to operations, and the O2R means operations to research. So both of these activities uh, inform the other. And what we did last year and in what the National Water Model will incorporate is based on this geospatial data set called the NHD+. Uh, it has built on the National Elevation data set, hydrography data set, land cover data set, and watershed boundary data set that has taken 20 years to build by the USGS and EPA. Uh, it has 2.7 million reach catchments, which are each uniquely labeled small catchments uh, across the nation. What we did in the um, National Flood Interoperability Experiment was we computed the flow in all these 2.7 million reach catchments in 10 minutes at the Texas Advanced Computing Center. So we took the high resolution rapid refresh forecast, or the HER, from the National Weather Service. We used the NOAA-MP land atmosphere model to produce the runoff. Uh, that went into a flow routing model called RAPID, and from this we produced the stream flow forecast. And I want to point out that this is a WERF hydro forecasting model comes from NCAR, and uh, David Gotchis and his team at NCAR are the ones who put together this framework, and it is also the framework that's used for the national water model. 
The National Water Model itself is going to have several different versions, as you see here. Uh, there is an analysis and assimilation version that's um, every uh, hour it cycles, and it's for three hours duration. Um, there is a short-range flood prediction forecast in three-hour time intervals for two days ahead. There's a medium-range flow prediction, which is a daily flow forecast for 10 days ahead. And then there's a long-range water resources forecast for 30 days ahead. And these all have different meteorological forcings, and they involve assimilation of the stream gauge observations from the USGS. And in this year's model, there are 1,615 uh, water bodies that are represented uh, as level pool reservoirs. This is part of the NOAA uh, Science and Services Plan. This is called the Stairway to Heaven. Uh, and so what we're currently in is centralized water forecasting. So the million, uh, 2.7 million stream reaches will be forecasted for the continental US. 100 million people get a forecast for the first time. And the uh, National Water Center provides guidance uh, to its offices this year. Then there's going to be an emphasis on flash flood hydrology in urban areas. Then on next year on coastal uh, integration, coastal flooding integration. The following year on groundwater and droughts. And then in fiscal year 19 on water quality. So this is not just about flooding. It's about total water prediction. This is the highest priority that NOAA has for investment uh, this, in this fiscal cycle. Now in the Summer Institute, we're planning to have six research themes, which are here listed as Flood inundation mapping, indirect measurement, data assimilation and forecast error, flood emergency response, community case studies, and continental water balance. And let's first look at the flood inundation mapping. So what I concluded after going through the uh, Summer Institute was that we have been doing what I would call watershed hydrology, basins and outlet points. So the current river forecast system has 6,600 basins and 3,600 forecast points. The new one is going to have 2.7 million stream reaches and catchments. And so really what we're doing is transitioning from watershed hydrology to continental hydrology. A single national stream network, atmosphere to the oceans, coast to coast, considered as a single entity and all computed at once. So weather modeling is becoming water modeling. Now, when we were working on this, we decided to try to understand what could be done with flood mapping. And if we say, oh, let's put together all the studies that have been done in the past about flood mapping, and you get all the cross-sections for those, and you start overlaying them, and you see, wait a minute, uh, they all overlap in sort of strange ways. I don't think that's going to work out too well. So we needed to consider the problem from a larger scale perspective. And the USGS has a and if National Weather Service had a flood, flood inundation mapping strategy that looks like this, where there's an elevation, and as each um, as the water rises and falls, the, uh, the polygons shrink and, and expand um, in the map. And this is for us for a limited range of a mile upstream, a mile downstream of a given gauge point. So we're going to build on that idea. And in doing that, we're going to use a technique um, called height above nearest drainage. So we come into this with catchments and flow lines that come from the NHD Plus and a digital elevation model. And from that, you can compute a height above nearest, nearest drainage, which is the elevation of a lat surface cell relative to a cell in the stream to which it flows. And from that, you can get an inundation map of just looking at the depth to stream less than 15 feet. So if you think about Bernoulli's equation, we've got z plus y plus v squared over 2g. Well, the z is the digital elevation model. And the hand um, raster is like the y term in Bernoulli's equation. If we analyze it this way, we can do the inundation mapping directly from the GIS system, and we can do it across the whole country. So our large-scale experiment for 2016 is to combine hydrography and elevation to define river channel geometry and flood inundation extent for 5 million kilometers of stream reaches over the continental United States. And in doing that, we're going to collaborate with the Cyber GIS computing facility at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. The theme leader for the flood inundation mapping component is going to be Sagi Cohen, who's an assistant professor in the geography program at the University of Alabama. And Sagi is especially an expert in flood inundation uh, estimation from satellite remote sensing, as an example that's shown here. So um, we want to welcome Sagi to the team here, and we'll be hearing more from him next week when we talk when the theme leaders talk about their work. The second uh, 
area here is uh, densified measurement, and that's being supported by radar measurement technologies. So there's a next generation level radar that can measure water surface elevation for the capital cost is about $5,000, which is much less than the cost of a full USGS gauging station. You can also measure the surface velocity for $12,000. And if we're going to have all of this forecasting and all these stream reaches, I think we're going to have to have some densified measurement across the country. And just to give a sense of what that means, if we've got about 8,000 gauges for the USGS across the country. There's, if we consider them the gold standard, uh, and there's going to be 2.7 million stream reaches calculated in the national water model. And what that means is that for every gauge, there are 340 reaches that are being calculated. And I suggest that we need to have some intermediate levels of measurement in between uh, having the USGS gauges and having these uh, computations that would measure water level and surface velocity or just water level. And we're talking about having a densified measurement, a demonstration site set up near Tuscaloosa for the summer institute. Another person who has volunteered to help is this person by the name of Jonathan Nelson. He's with the U.S. Geological Survey in Golden, Colorado. And he does detailed modeling of local river reaches. And so the very detailed two-dimensional and three-dimensional hydraulics to look at what actually happens in flow near a bridge or along a particular stream reach. And so we want to augment this densified measurement with modeling of the flow in the local reach that's being sensed. The leader for this work is going to be Sarah Praskovitz, who's an assistant professor in the geography program at the University of Alabama. Uh, and Sarah is doing, at this moment, a flood mapping study in southeastern Alabama that uh, some of the mapping is uh, shown here, and she'll leverage that for the um, Summer Institute. The third uh, theme is data assimilation and forecast error. And one of the ins insights into that is a program developed by the University of Iowa. So at the uh, University of Iowa, there is an Iowa flood center. And they have laid out across Iowa uh, 224 water level sensors of the kind that I was just describing. And if you combine those with the USGS flow gauging stations, you have 461 points where streams are being measured in Iowa, and two of which 224 are just the level, and the, other, the rest have level and flow. And so we want to be able to make a detailed study of this information from Iowa to understand how we can determine forecast errors, how can we reduce forecast errors through densified measurement, how can we use data assimilation to adjust the forecast, the observations, um, what, where should we place these additional sensors, and how many do we need, and if we have different input sources, for example, of rainfall on the forecast model, how does that change the uh, properties of the solution? And the leader for this is going to be uh, Ibrahim Demir. He's with the Iowa Flood Center at the University of Iowa. And what we would like to move towards is the idea that there are replicates of the forecast discharge using ensemble prediction so that we can actually quantify the forecast error. And this is particularly ensemble forecasting from the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasting, which we used last summer in our work then. Uh, <coughs> the next is... Uh, the uh, theme is flood emergency response, and that deals with how do local organizations, emergency response organizations like, in this case, the Austin Fire Department, how do we help them to be able to better plan uh, flood emergency response uh, in our city? In this case, we're preparing a community flood response map book that shows for particular rivers from one road to the next road, what does a minor flood mean, what does moderate flood mean, what does major flood mean. Those are National Weather Service definitions of flood severity. And in this map book, we are preparing maps. This is one called a strategic overview map. This is used by the city manager and by the chief of staff of the fire department to deploy resources during a flood emergency by understanding the levels of risk and the impacted communities at different locations along the river. This happens to be Onion Creek in South Austin that's had two major floods in the last two years, and several hundred houses have been flooded each time, and some people have been killed on each occasion. Uh, associated with that is a pre-planning flood map with much greater degree of detail in it, and the information about how, much, how many houses are flooded to what depth. The red dots here mean flooding is greater than three feet in depth. The yellow dots means 10 inches to three feet. So the yellow dots, you can survive, but the three, above three feet of flooding, you have to get out. And 
the orange areas here are roads that are inundated, and the little yellow notes are the depth and velocity uh, of the inundation. And on the right-hand side, you see notes about at 25 feet, these roads need to be closed, and so on, and how many people have to be rescued from the left side of the river and the right side of the river, and so on. These maps are being worked out for the city of Austin, and we would like to work them out in Tuscaloosa as a case study example. So I will be the theme leader for this particular um, theme, and Harry Evans, who you see here, who was Chief of Staff of the Austin Fire Department, will be helping us with that. So he's uh, the person who's been directing this flood emergency response planning uh, component. Uh, the next um, theme is community case studies. And so the question here is, how can communities that want to participate in the national, uh, with the National Water Centre do so, and they can do so by working with students from a local university. And the person who's going to lead that effort is going to be uh, Alfonso Mejia, who's an assistant professor in the Civil Engineering Department at Penn State University. Uh, in Austin and Philadelphia, and perhaps some other communities, will be community case studies. Uh, this is some images that you see here are from Philadelphia Water. And Ibrahim is a specialist in this part of the country. Sorry, Alfonso is a specialist in this part of the country. And so flooding in Philadelphia is a, a significant issue, not simply because of the inundation of the area, but also because they've got a combined sewer system. And so when it floods, they actually are flooding the sanitary system as well as the storm drainage system. And this is Philadelphia's part of the Delaware River Basin. And so there's a whole regional context that has to come into play here so that when you're talking about flooding in the city, you've got to understand the flooding in the basin that contributes to that. And Alfonso is going to be the person leading that activity. And the final um, theme has to do with uh, continental scale water balance. And the motivation for that is that part of the idea of the national water model is to have a common operating picture over, over the whole continent. This particular graphic uh, comes from the Australian Bureau of Meteorology. And they have a very extensive uh, water resource information system. They've spent over $300 million on it after their disastrous droughts of the last decade. And you can see a perspective here that starts at the present and it goes back into the past to be able to understand the perspective of the past and produce foresight for the future, days, weeks, months, and years into the future. So they do uh, something called the Australian Water Resource Assessment Model, which is called the ARA. Um, and they have an ORAL for ORA land, which is like our NOAA MP model. So they're doing many of the same things that we're doing here are also being done in Australia. They have a seven-day streamflow forecast and seasonal streamflow forecasting, and they're actually going further out into the future than we are in terms of the uh, seasonal streamflow forecasting that they're doing. But it's a very sophisticated operation, and because Australia is about the same size as the continental United States and it's organized into a single system through the Bureau of Meteorology, I think we've got something that we can learn from collaboration with them. Among other things, they have a soil moisture conditions that are being recomputed every day right up to the present for their whole country. And so the blue through the red colors here compare the current computation with what the previous values computed at the same location at the same time of the year were. So blue is highest on record and red is lowest on record. And you can get a synoptic scale picture of where soil moisture is high or low at any particular location. And I think we should be doing this kind of thing uh, for the United States as well and producing a common operating picture of the current water condition of the nation uh, every day as part of what we do for the National Water Centre. So the person who's going to be helping us with that is Albert Van Dyke. Uh, Albert is the leader of something called AussieWex, which is the Australian GWEX, or Global Energy and Water Experiment. Um, and he's... Uh, their community scale leader, you could say, for continental hydrology in Australia. And he's going to be coming to the National Water Centre for the first two weeks of the Summer Institute uh, and be working uh, with us on that. And we would like to think that as we start building a continental water balance or common operating picture, we can be starting to think about how this would be done across the globe. So these continental scale pictures could evolve towards a global scale picture. So. That's the end of the formal presentation that I have, and I want to, uh, to flag the fact that next week we will have another webinar with more technical detail about the themes uh, that be, I'll be jointly presenting with the theme leaders that I introduced uh, uh, in this presentation. 
Uh, the following week from that, there will be presentations made by the students who participated in last year's Summer Institute, and they will be coordinated by Pierong Lin and by uh, Adnan, who's from Purdue University, and they, they are going to be the coordinators for the student uh, program this year. And then the following uh, week after that, uh, Dave Gotchis is going to be uh, giving a presentation about the WIF Hydro and the National Water Model, and it's his framework from NCAR that's been used for that. So there's going to be more detail at these uh, uh, presentations that follow. Uh, this is just a, an attempt to introduce things and to start the engagement with your, the community. So that's the end of my presentation, and you're welcome to ask questions. Thank you so much, David. That was very informative. So at this time, we can open up the floor to the participants who are on the phone line. If anyone has a question, uh, go ahead and type it into the chat box that you see on your screen, and I can read it out to the group, and we will answer it as best that we can. Uh, so while, while people are maybe typing, I did put the URL to the Summer Institute web page on the Quasi website into the chat box again as well. So again, take a look at that and uh, feel free to reach out to us if you have any additional questions. Um, Emily, could you unmute? I uh, see Abraham is on the call and Sarah Preskovitz. Yeah, so I actually don't have anyone muted. So, uh, oh, okay. Uh, I'm here. So, this is Sarah. Hey, Sarah, do you want to say anything? Um, not in particular, because I guess we'll be going into our themes in more detail um, next week. But uh -huh. I just want to say welcome to everyone, and you know we're excited to uh, be doing the Summer Institute again, and uh, looking forward to receiving applications. Mm -hmm. Abraham, do you have any thoughts? Looks like Abraham may not be connected through the phone. Oh, he's dialing in now. Okay. Uh, so there is um, a question that came in from Brian that says, thank you for the wonderful presentation. Can you please comment on how often PhD students have been able to turn these summer projects into their PhD dissertation? Um, Brian, I, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, I think this is an ongoing process. Last year was the first time that we've done this. So undoubtedly, the students who participated last year got a vision for continental hydrology and how it can evolve. And a number of papers were developed that are now being brought forward to publication from the research projects that they did. That's about the best way that I can answer that, I think. Um, so Ahmad says, how can federal agencies such as USACE, ERDIC participate within the research themes? So uh, Ahmad, we're very uh, welcome to uh, engage with you. Uh, Sarah Preskovitz, in the study that she's doing on the University of Alabama, is using the auto route model that you and your colleagues have developed at ERDIC. Sarah, do you want to say a few words about that? Yeah, so the project I'm doing is um, an inner comparison of several hydraulic models for simulating flood inundation extent and depth using um, a watershed in southeastern Alabama as a case study. And one of the models that's included in that inner comparison is um, the auto route model that was developed um, at the Army Corps ERDC facility. And um, several of the model developers came to campus about a month ago to help us get the model um, set up. And um, they you know, were, uh, I think, also um, you know, working with some of the students uh, from last summer institute who were using auto route for a project. So um, I'm sure they would be willing to uh, participate in the summer institute again, whether by uh, perhaps teaching a workshop or uh, consulting with individual student groups. Um, you know, Vicksburg is only three, three and a half hours away, so it's pretty convenient to involve them. Okay. Thank you, Sarah. Um, Katie Brownson says, what sorts of disciplinary backgrounds do you expect the students to be coming from? Are you looking only for hydrology students? Katie, no, we'd like to have a, a broader base uh, of students than hydrology. 
And in fact, that's one of the things that I'd like to broaden out, if possible, this year. Um, we did have mostly hydrology students last year. And, and there's one advantage to that, and that is that everyone has sort of a common vocabulary, but really we need to learn from one another. And I think it'll be more interesting if we have students from uh, atmospheric science or GIS or computational science or geography or other fields than simply hydrology. Um, Ibrahim, you're now back. Do you want to make any comments? Hey, hi, David. So, yeah, I was just in the listening mode, but I'm not, I don't have anything to add, but I'd like to all welcome all the applicants and the attendees of this webinar. And I think we'll have a, another seminar, I mean, webinar next week, so we will provide more details. But in the meantime, if anyone has any question about specific teams, they can contact us, the individual uh, team leaders, I think. Thank you. Yes, that's right. You can just contact the team leaders directly. So if you'd like to participate, or if your advisor is interested, we would very much like to engage student advisors in this process so that in, if, some, if you're proposing something um, that you'd like to be engaged in for the Summer Institute as part of your application, or if a student is doing that, we would like this to be a student advisor team and have the advisor involved in formulating the research efforts so that it's not simply being done by some people in Alabama with students, working with students, but we engage the faculty from institutions across the country. Okay, any other thoughts here? Um, this Chris Franklin is on the phone. Chris, you were a student at the Summer Institute. Can you describe a little bit about your experience? Uh, yes, can you hear me, David? Yeah, we got you, we hear you. Okay. Um, uh, I, I had a very good experience. I come from a geospatial information science background with lots of GIS. And although uh, I had an understanding of hydrology when I went into the program last year, uh, I, w I found it very, uh, very rewarding to have people from different backgrounds working on these amazing projects. And it was an incredible learning experience, not only for myself and the, uh, the uh, individuals that I brought with me, but Having come back to the university at UT Dallas, we don't have a civil engineering school here, but we now have a lot of interest in this uh, water area. And I think that one of the big strengths of this institute uh, going forward is this ability to draw in many different uh, constituencies uh, at the student uh, application level. And so I'm really excited to, to see how it works out this summer. And I see Tim Schneider on the phone here, the, the high resolution rapid refresh Forecast is Tim. Are you on the phone? Uh, yeah, Dave, I am. Yeah, do you want to say something about the HER and the plans that you have for developing ensemble forecasting from the HER? Um, yeah, just at a high level, and uh, it, I, I was remiss in forwarding the announcement of this to my colleague David Dowell, a fellow Texan, um, who who's been I know kind of taking a point on our end on this, but. Um, I'll see if I can't get them plugged into some of the next calls that are coming up. Uh, but yeah, so the, the basic idea is that the high resolution rapid refresh is a um, weather forecast model that covers the CONUS US a little bit beyond the CONUS uh, at three kilometer resolution. And as its name su uh, suggests, it's, it's run at a rapid uh, cycling. So it's very fresh. and it, assimilates radar data, which makes it really re unique in the weather modeling world because it really does a uh, much better job with the precipitation. And it's, it's running operationally at NCEP, which makes it a valuable tool uh, in that regard. And we have an experimental version that we run on NOAA's uh, high-performance computing research clusters called the HER-X for experimental. That's now running out to 24 hours. The operational HER runs to 18 hours. Um, and the, there's a lot of improvement to physics. The precip is much better. We've been watching it with some of these winter storms uh, in the northeast, and it's been doing a phenomenal job with those. So, uh, and then the next big development there is to start looking at a, a kind of a poor man's ensemble, if you would want to call it that, where uh, you sort of have a um, an ensemble caused by um, different initialized time. So it, it limits the time horizon of the ensemble forecast, but it's a very computationally cheap way of producing an ensemble. And we're looking at um, 
you know, just down the road, even beyond that, a more proper HER ensemble, which is very computational, computationally intensive. That's down the road a little ways. And we're, we're thinking about concepts such as a global rapid refresh. Uh, but again, that, you know, that's resource dependent. That's down the road also. But uh, is that what you're looking for, Dave? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think so. Tim is the lead person at the Earth System Research Laboratory in Boulder, Colorado, in terms of the experimental development of the rainfall forecast and precipitation weather forecasting that we're using. So we're working in collaboration with uh, he and his team on that. And I think this ensemble forecast is, you know, just absolutely critical, Tim, because, you know, to quantify the uncertainty in the flow, we've got to have uncertainty in what goes into it. I yeah, and I, I think the other thing worth noting, David, yeah, thanks for those kind words, by the way. And I, I should say um, that really David Dowell, Stan Benjamin, Curtis Alexander, and, and, and a whole host of others are really leading the technical development. I'm, I'm, I'm on the management side, so I don't want to take too much credit. Uh, but we're also looking at embedding high-resolution nests. We have a project with our sister lab out here in Boulder in the physical science division looking at maybe trying to do some one kilometer nests over urban areas. And that, that's also down the road a little bit, not so far down the road. So that's another opportunity I omitted. But you know, Dave, David, if, if you think it's useful, we can entertain notions of having some uh, seminars in this summer's um, uh, institute, um, you know, having folks provide some tutorials on the weather forcing side of things. If you like, we can talk offline. Sure, and maybe you could do a seminar, a webinar in this sequence that we're having this spring, you know, perhaps that was speaking after David Gorgeous. Um, yeah, uh, we can definitely um, entertain that thought. It's probably, what, about a month out? Yeah. So Tim Lamaris has a question. Is there a reason why there will no longer be a visiting scholar track this year? A lot of students have ongoing research responsibilities at their home institutions and may not be able to be in Tuscaloosa for the entire summer. So that's a policy question, and I'm going to let Emily respond to that. Emily, can you speak to that? Sure. So, yeah, um, it was a change that we decided to make this year, and I think there are a number of reasons behind it. Um, one being that, uh, the, you know, the the non-visiting, or the, I'm sorry, the visiting tract adds kind of another layer of uh, logistical coordination involved. But really, we wanted we wanted the students in the program to be able to be on site for the whole time. We wanted to be able to support the students' advisors at home uh, really being engaged in the project. And so that's why we decided to add the additional award to allow the advisors to come down and uh, you know, partake in the Summer Institute and, and check it out for themselves. So we, you know, we're hoping that by, by allowing the advisors to come down, building that into the student award, um, we'll be able to promote that additional level of engagement. Um, yeah. Do you have anything to add, David? Uh, and, and Tim, yeah, it, it, that's, it's a policy management level decision. And if you want to take it up with quasi management in Boston, then that's fine. You know, you're welcome to do that. Uh, that's, you can, that's, if I'm, you have uh, additional questions on that, Tim, you can certainly send me send me an email. Yeah, I, further. Rick Hooper is the president of Quasi, you know, he's making the policy here. Mm -hmm. um, Marcelo, is there any way that some of the presentations can be given in a webinar format so that ones that would like to not participate but cannot go there? So um, that's a good question. So what we did last year um, was that we had a all hands meeting on Friday after lunch. And we could make that in a webinar format that could be recorded, or people could participate um, as we are doing now. So we could have the all hands. Um, I think it was, was actually a quasi webinar that we used for that. Yeah, so, so that's something that we could probably consider building into the program, um, especially if you know people are going to be doing those those types of weekly updates updates again. Uh -huh. um, so that's something I think we should probably discuss further and uh, see, see what the options might be for that. Yeah, what, what happened last year, Emily, is that um, Fernando Stalas, who was one of the student coordinators, um, and he and Joseph um, uh, Gudenson, they gathered together slides from each of the project teams 
And then they, they just put together one slide set and then each of the teams stepped up and they spoke to their own work as mm -hmm. part of that report at the end of each week. So it was really pretty well organised ahead of time. Mm -hmm. And so I actually participated in all of the um, on all of the weekly summary meetings, even though I wasn't in Alabama. So I was asking questions and questions were being asked of me um, in that manner, although I plan to be in Alabama more this summer than I was last summer, but that's how it worked in. It, it seemed like we could do that, I think. Yeah, I think so too. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other thoughts here? Um, I see Nick Fang on the phone here from UT Arlington. You got any thoughts, Nick? Oh, uh, yeah, uh, I do think, I mean, this, uh, that will be a great opportunity for the students who can attend the uh, Summer Institute. And uh, if we can kind of uh, um, bring a project, like a focusing on Texas, the floods last year, that will be a great project, I mean, so for students to work on. Uh -huh. Great. And I see Frank Bell here from the National Weather Service. You got any thoughts, Frank? Uh, sure, David. Uh, excited to see the Summer Institute in its second year of existence. And uh, <clears throat> here at West Gulf RSP in Fort Worth, we look forward to assisting in uh, any way that we can. Yes, yeah, so we, as Nick said, we're trying to have an emphasis sort of regionally here in Texas, Frank. Um, so we, you know, perhaps we should talk offline, but we'd like to understand how we can now, with UT Arlington, UT Dallas already involved, UT Austin and UT San Antonio, that's four universities in Texas. You know, we could do something jointly across the region rather than just having one location. Um, any other thoughts? Is there anybody else who's on the phone that would like to say something? It doesn't necessarily have to be typed into the chat window here. Any, Marcelo, are you there? Marcelo Somos Valenzuela? I don't, it doesn't sound like Marcelo's going to speak, so. Well, Emily, do you want to declare victory here? Yeah, I think this is a, a great way to kick off the uh, Summer Institute application period and kick off the, you know, the series of webinars that we're going to have. So. Um, again, we will be meeting at the same time next Wednesday, so it's, it's 3 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time when we will hear from each of the theme leaders, and so that should help uh, provide more detail about kind of the, the topics that are going to be focused on over the, the course of the Summer Institute. So um, I, think, I think, David, that we are maybe good to, good to end it here for this week. Okay, thanks so much, Emily. All right, well, thank you everyone that joined the presentation today. This webinar has been recorded, and I will post it onto the Quasi website at the link I provided earlier. And uh, please tune in next week for more information. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thanks, David.